So the article goes on. Uh, I'm saying that a lot, but I really pulled a lot of articles that we can't read every word of. Continuing on, though, here's Joe Biden uh, announcing recently a plan for a temporary port on Gaza's coast to increase the flow of humanitarian aid. Hey, fucko, why don't you just make Israel let the aid through? Then you wouldn't need a peer. Do you think they're not going to attack the peer as well? Do you think that that's just going to go? How many... You know, how much kind of stepping around the problem of just, you know, hear no evil, see no evil, are you going to do here? This does not address the problem. So anyway, Biden will announce a plan in his State of the Union address Thursday for the U.S. military to help to establish a temporary port on the Gaza coast, increasing the flow of humanitarian aid for the beleaguered territory during the Israel-Hamas war. I mean, so it would, uh, the U.S. military has, quote, unique capabilities and can do things from, quote, just offshore. I mean, or you could restrain Israel because it's literally the U.S. at every level who is directly enabling Israel to do what it's doing. Militarily, it is arming them. It's funding them economically. It's also parking warships around the world to prevent and off of the coast directly to prevent anyone from trying to intervene and stop Israel. It's diplomatically blocking every single resolution at the United Nations, which would condemn Israel. They wouldn't be able to do this without the U.S., but you're building a pier. Um, aid groups have said that it has become nearly impossible to deliver supplies within most of Gaza because of the difficulty of coordinating with the Israeli military, the ongoing hostilities, and the breakdown of public order. The U.S. military recently began airdropping aid into Gaza. I'll mention one of those airdrops actually killed people. I forget if it was the parachute malfunctioning or whatever. I mean, some of that just stopped the fucking bombing. Pull Israel back. You know, uh, n nobody really wants to see this happening. And yet on it goes. Why is that? Who's enabling this? These are simple questions that are just not really being um, answered, you know, to some extent asked uh, sufficiently and then definitely not being answered in a way that's going to lead to a clear solution. But increasingly, I, I don't know where Israel goes after this because the world is turning on them as they should be. This is reprehensible and totally unsupportable. So the U.S. Green Party had a statement on this. Uh, Green Party, Gaza needs a ceasefire, not a peer. Political stunts like Biden's peer are not designed to halt the suffering. And so I share this, as I said before, there are some kind of left parties in the U.S., not necessarily communist, but more people even engaging in these would, uh, you know, first of all, do some good and then also provide, uh, you know, experience, knowledge, and just a basis for criticism and dialogue within the left. Anyway, continuing... Uh, the Green Party of the United States called on President Biden to demand an immediate ceasefire in Gaza, dismissing his call for a humanitarian peer as grossly ineffective in responding to the death and suffering of Palestinians. Quote, given the, the completion of the peer will take approximately two months, many Palestinians will continue to die from starvation. Direct delivery of aid into the area, as well as safe entry for the waiting aid trucks, will provide at least some relief to those in need, primarily women and children, said Jennifer Sullivan, spokesperson for the National Women's Caucus within the Green Party. The party said that at a minimum, Biden should insist on opening new border crossings to provide immediate food, water, and medical supplies to the millions of Palestinians facing starvation. Many aid trucks, although, of course, if you do this, um, more people can actually see what's happening there, and that's the last thing that they want. Many aid trucks are waiting to get into Gaza at the Rafah crossing. Only an immediate and lasting ceasefire will enable the massive humanitarian response needed after five months of Israel's indiscriminate bombardment of Gaza. Quote, the killing of tens of thousands of Palestinians, including many children and women with United States tax dollars, needs to be halted immediately. The Biden administration is guilty of war crimes for its complicity in aiding this genocide in Palestine. Political stunts like Biden's peer are not designed to halt the suffering in Gaza, but rather are just callous attempts to prop up his plummeting poll numbers, said Daryl Mock, National Party co-chair. 
As Israel's military raids continue across the West Bank, in addition to the assault on Gaza, its government has approved the expansion of several thousand illegal settler homes in the occupied territories. Israel's assault on Gaza is an extension of its ongoing land grab from Palestinians. The Green Party platform states, quote, We reject the grossly unbalanced financial and military support of Israel by the U.S. while Israel occupies Palestinian lands. We also reject U.S. political support for Israel and demand that the U.S. government end its veto of Security Council resolutions pertaining to Israel. We urge our government to join with the U.N. to secure Israel's complete withdrawal to at least the 1967 boundaries and comply fully with international law. And that is the uh, Green Party of the United States statement about that. Vice President Kamala Harris called for a, quote, immediate ceasefire in Gaza. The vice president pushes Israel to do more to help Palestinians. I'm sorry, does it look like they're trying to do anything to help Palestinians? They're doing ethnic cleansing. What are you talking about? Quote, no excuses. Wow. If only Kamala Harris had some power. If only she could do something. If only she was, I don't know, the vice president of the United States. So more just absolutely empty posturing from this genocidal administration. And um, speaking of, there is a map. If you want to see where in the United States is providing the weapons... So this is an article from Truthout. Activists unveil a map of facilities actively producing weapons for Israel. Palestine Solidarity Activists Research revealed the expansive, tangled web of the arms production process. This is from March 7th, so 11 days ago. And basically in there, there is a map. Uh, let me see if I can find the actual thing. There it is. So there's a screenshot of the map to give you some idea of different locations around the US and uh, you can find that link in the article that I just read the headline of if you look up that headline and you know it, people have been doing protests and different things in front of these weapons facilities I think if you look through that article actually there is um, there are probably some pictures there of uh, of protests being held in front of those places of course I'm pulling up the screenshots uh, without those pictures but, uh, you know, use your imagination. So what else is being done? I mean, because we do need to do whatever we can do to oppose this. And there are some labor unions that have been getting involved. So we saw the UAW, United Auto Workers. This is part of the, still in its infancy, but resurgence of labor in this country. Uh, this is an article from Common Dreams. UAW Labor for Palestine's Endorsement. Um, they're endorsing uncommitted in Michigan. So this is, again, that uncommitted campaign. Biden has now won the presidential nomination in the Democratic Party primary. He didn't really face any strong competition. There was Marianne Williamson and a couple of other people. Uh, none of them were really doing any serious numbers is what I mean. But people were voting uncommitted in droves, just as a vote of no confidence, basically against Joe, Joe Biden. And um, so the UAW for Labor... Uh, was part of this. So people sometimes say, you know, the U.S. Uh, labor movement, you know, being from the first world, it's not internationalist in any way. Uh, here's an example of some U.S. organized uh, labor overcoming that and engaging in some internationalism and using the clout that they have as organized labor to make internationalist political demands. So we want to see more of that, absolutely. And then um, kind of along the same lines, um, there was out of India, this headline, the Water Transport Workers Federation of India refuses to load or unload Israel bound weapons on any ships. So we need to understand there's different levels of protest. There is symbolic protest, which is, um, you know, doesn't directly affect supply chains or things like that. But I mean, it's still a risk and it is still in the, in the political side of things. Uh, somewhat meaningful. Then there's also, um, you know, using your strength as organized labor to actively do what the workers want to do. So in this case, they are saying no. So here, here's the article. The Water Transport Workers Federation of India, which represents more than 3,500 workers at 11 major ports in the country, said that they will not load 
or unload weaponized cargoes from Israel or any other nation which carries military equipment to be taken to Palestine. So that is the kind of thing that we need to see increasingly as time goes on. Quote, port workers, part of labor unions, would always stand against the war and killing innocent people like women and children. The recent attack of Israel on Gaza, plunging thousands of Palestinians into immense suffering and loss. Women and children have been blown to pieces in the war. Parents were unable to recognize their children killed in bombings as bombs were exploding everywhere, the union said in a press release. Calling for a, quote, immediate ceasefire, the trade union said, quote, our union members have collectively decided to refuse handling all types of weaponized cargoes. Loading and unloading these weapons helps to provide organizations with the ability to kill innocent people, unquote. The press release said, as responsible trade unions, we just declare our solidarity with those who campaign for peace. We call upon the workers of the world and peace-loving people to stand with the demand of a free Palestine. So there you go. Uh, that is, you know, unionized workers, of course, will lobby for increased pay, improved working conditions, and all that kind of stuff as part of the overall class struggle. But you can also engage in internationalist actions like that. And this is a preview of what you can do under socialism, because that's obviously under capitalism, just uh, labor is a counterpower. The main power is capital. Labor organizes itself as a counterpower. But then at some point, if there is a proper struggle, they can depose capital and become the dominant power, at which point capital becomes the counterpower. And then uh, there is a proletarian state constructed to outlaw capitalism and suppress the capitalists until capitalism is eradicated. But yeah, this is a preview of what you can do under socialism when workers are in charge and exercising proletarian international solidarity. So that's really key.